So welcome to Magazzino da Casa. My name is Teresa Kittler and I am the 2020-2021 Scholar in Residence at Magazzino Italian Art, the museum and research centre dedicated to advancing the scholarship and public appreciation of post-war and contemporary Italian art in the United States. As a non-profit museum now in its fourth year, it's it's been advocating for and celebrating the work of Italian artists from Arte Povera to the present day. Today, we welcome you back for the final lecture in our annual series, which um, has turned its attention to friendships and partnerships within Arte Povera to consider the extent to which collaboration forms part of the narrative of artistic production in Italy in the post-war period. We've also um, asked whether it's possible to think beyond the trope of the muse when addressing the contribution of women as partners and ask how dialogue and exchange have visibly shaped the work of otherwise well-known male figures. Organizing this series has been a collaborative effort with my colleagues here at Magazzino and I'd like to thank them all for their support in putting this together. And a special thanks to Alexandra Theodoropoulou, Eve Aron, Karolina Koinowska, Juliet Vincente, and Magazzino's director, Vittorio Calabrese. You can find out more about each event on Magazzino's website page, Magazzino da Casa, and the lecture today will uh, last around um, approximately 40 to 45 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A se session, uh, which will be shared by me, and to which we encourage you all to participate with comments or questions. And you can do so by signing in um, and using the, uh, the chat function during or um, immediately after the talk. It's a real pleasure to introduce the fourth and final lecture today, which will be given by Dr. Leslie Cotsey, a scholar whose work on the questions of gender and sexuality in post-war Italian art um, in relation to figures like Carla Cabi, Carla Lonzi and Marisa Mertz has been such an important point of reference for me and so many other scholars. Her lecture today titled Communion and Prophylaxis, Mario and Marisa Mertz discusses the early sculpture and later work on paper of the only officially recognized artistic couple in Arte Povera, Mario Mertz and Marisa Mertz. So an appropriate topic to end the series. And Leslie Cotzi is the Associate Curator for Prints, Drawings and Photographs at the Baltimore Museum of Art. She was the 2017-2018 Andrew W. Mellon Foundation National Endowment for the Humanities postdoctoral Rome Prize winner in modern Italian studies at the American Academy in Rome, working uh, on a manuscript on gender and sexuality in post-war and contemporary Italian art. Previously, she served as the curatorial associate at the Grunwald Center for the Graphic Arts at the Hammer Museum, where she helped to organize several um, exhibitions, including, but by no means a comprehensive list, William E. Jones' Imitation of Christ, Forest Best, Seeing Things Invisible, Tea and Morphine, Women in Paris, 1880 to 1914, and Marisa Mertz, The Sky is a Great Space. Leslie received her BA in 2003 from Yale University and her PhD in 2012 from the University of Virginia. Her work has been widely published, including in scholarly journals, anthologies, and exhibition catalogues. Um, in most recently, Marisa Mertz, The Sky is a Great Space, the Manil Collections, Publication, Apparitions, Frottages and Rubbings from 1860 to now, and the Pomona College Museum of Arts exhibition catalogue, The Pages, Mirella Bentivoglio, Selected Works, 1966 to 2012. So a really warm welcome to you, Leslie. Um, you, um, I hand over to you to, to share your screen and, and start the talk. Thank you so much, Teresa, and thank you to the staff and uh, the director at Magazzino for the invitation. Um, and I suppose I should thank many colleagues uh, at the American Academy and the Hammer Museum 
who had a hand in this research as well. Um, let me just start my slideshow. Uh, all right. So, um, and I will say that I, I, I will, I, I will maybe not have time to talk too much about drawings today because the talk, as I was putting it together, I realized was a little long. So we will be focusing more on the early sculptures than the drawings. Uh, in 1972, the Italian architecture magazine Domus ran a short feature on the Turin apartment the artists Mario and Marisa Mer shared with their then 12-year-old daughter Beatrice. The remarkable images show a home positively overrun with artwork. The gleaming aluminum tubes of Marisa Mertz's monumental early living sculpture burst forth from ceilings and corners as if vying for space with the unadorned skeletons of Mario's signature igloos. The crowding is palpable. In one image, the living sculpture cascades from the ceiling, nearly enveloping the TV placed on the dresser below it. Uh, to the right of the TV, we see one of the coiled blankets that both Mario and Marisa included in early installations. The work, it's hard to see, but it's embroidered with the phrase Hotel Chelsea, New York, uh, onto which are, and, on, and onto it are superimposed the numbers one, two, three, and five. The first four numerals of the Fibonacci sequence, a popular motif in Mario's work, are visible again just to the right of that, this time in neon, on what appear to be child's clothes. In the kitchen, the bare steel frame of Mario's igloo occupies the area next to the dining table, forcing one of the ornate dining chairs aside. Marisa's aluminum curls are suspended above the radiator, table, and stove, jostling the chandelier out of plumb and invading the space of the vent hood. In the cluttered office, or at least the room tangentially defined as an office, thanks to the presence of the typewriter, more tubular appendages from the living sculpture emerge from a corner beside the desk. One of the tubes has been embellished with splotchy yellow and blue paint, demonstrating that Marisa was experimenting with embellishing the otherwise bare aluminum surfaces at this early juncture, despite the fact that the work would not be exhibited that way until decades later. An igloo frame wrapped in netting is suspended from above as if it were a low hanging cupola. The spatial hier hierarchy of the other rooms has been reversed. Rather than allowing Marisa sculpture to rain down from above, Mario's igloo has retaken the high ground. Amidst all of this, the family is curiously absent. A single male figure is pictured, and it is not Mario, but rather the isolated figure on the television that functions as a cheeky reminder of the absent human inhabitants. The arrangement of the works in the apartment are in some likelihood the result of happenstance, as two highly productive and mobile individuals made a virtue out of necessity in an admittedly tiny space. And yet the images illustrate a point. It is as if the scale of the artwork has grown so invasive and the competition for space so intense that the makers have been forced to scatter and their production is all that is left in their wake. I begin by talking about these images because I see this competition for space as an important metaphor for these artists' careers. The creative partnership between Mario and Marisa Mertz, who were married in 1960 and remained together until Mario's death in 2003, was an incredibly productive one, and Mario's work benefited from Marisa's involvement enormously. Yet for Marisa, whose status as an artist was rendered more problematic because of her role as wife and mother, her relationship with Mario was both obstructive and generative. The photos were published at a moment that was a relatively early juncture professionally for both of them. Nevertheless, at this point, Mario's career was already more well-established than Marisa's. He had already had 15 solo exhibitions between 1953 and May 1972, including venues in Paris, New York, and Minneapolis. She had had two, both of which were within Italy. Thus already by 1972, Mario occupied the public role of the artist more visibly than she did. Yet Marisa Mertz's living sculpture displayed in the home come studio come exhibition space of their turn apartment penetrates every corner of the space refusing the relative differences in scale and value by which their individual bodies and discrete practices would be defined. It caricatures the differences in public visibility and physical appearance that would become axiomatic in the critical literature on the couple. The text accompanying the Doma spread makes such, an, such differences all too apparent. 
The title, Pico La Casa Soto El Grande Iglu, it initiates a series of binary oppositions between Marisa, the homemaker, and Mario, the respected artist. The English translation given, small house under the large igloo, somewhat obscures the full force of the original title, as grande means not only large, but also great. The accompanying short paragraph, indicative of existing scholarship on the couple as a whole, amplifies this series of comparisons between Mario and Marisa, male and female, large and small, public and private, high and low, visible and invisible, superior and inferior. Nevertheless, the photographs wherein Marisa's work is as imposing as Mario's, if not more so, belie such gendered binaries. Thus, I read the arrangement of the works in the apartment as a tangible embodiment of an as yet unexamined premise, which insists on the ambition, scale, and seriousness of Marisa's work with respect to Mario's. So today I will be focusing the, on the roughly 10 year period between the mid 1960s and 1970s the dialectic of competition was not isolated to the early moment in their careers. Throughout their 40 year marriage, Mario and Marisa's work gathered mutual strength from their shared opposition. That is, as much as Marisa frequently worked in concert with Mario and vice versa, their individual practices were often characterized by an elaborate and even combative form of call and response. While Marisa was reinterpreting artistic propositions generated by Mario, Mario Merz was borrowing materials, motifs, and themes associated with her. If, as visible in these images, the aluminum, aluminum coils of Marisa Merz's living sculpture suggest a grotesque parody of the curved metal skeletons of Mario's igloos, then Mario Merz's contemporaneous appropriation of kitchen casseroles, bedpans, and candle wax represents a guerrilla intervention into the domestic imaginary as well. Throughout the arc of their careers, conflict and collaboration have defined Emerts as the couple would be jointly known. Analyzing individual works in light of contemporary geopolitics, developments in Italian feminism, and the new domestic landscape of the period, today's talk will explore how together the husband and wife pair engaged in a dialectic that enabled them to respond productively to one another's practices while still maintaining individual points of view. Paying particular attention to the problematic of separatism and the challenges facing women artists in Italy in the 1960s and 70s, I would like to offer a new reading that recasts Marisa Merz's well-documented interest in alchemy in terms of contemporary developments in reproductive health technology. It is important to point out that we know next to nothing about the early life of Marisa Merz. The first firm date we have pertaining to her is 1960, the year she married Mario and gave birth to their daughter Beatrice. And this lacuna has largely been propagated by the artist herself. In an exchange published at the beginning of, of a 2011 flash art article, Mar Marisa Merz refuses to state where she was born. Were you born in Turin? The narrator asks. I really love that city, she responds. But were you born there? And her response, I can no longer recall. Against the utter dearth of information that exists about Marisa's childhood, Mario's is fairly fleshed out. By his own recollection, he grew up in Turin and retained memories of the chestnut tree outside his window, as well as the bombings that destroyed part of his father's house towards the end of World War II. By age 18, he had been arrested for associating with the partisan group Justicia e Libertà. He was encouraged to make art by an expressionist painter named Massimo Moreni and associated socially with members of a group of artists known as the Sepitori di Torino, while reading Kafka, Steinbeck, and the anti-fascist authors Cesare Pavese and Eugenio Montale. Montale. So what remains of his early paintings bear a certain resemblance to the dense, scumbly aesthetic of Cobra and Arte Informale, two important post-war European art movements. Mario declares himself opposed to the latter and dismisses the former as a decadent form of surface existentialism. His longtime supporter, Germano Celant, hailed him from the outset of his career as a dissident and cultural revolutionary. His is a hero's entrance to the art world, one with stage guides, a trip to the underworld, in Mario's case, a year stint in the dungeon of the Carceri Nuove in Turin, and hegemonic opponents, both political and cultural, that the protagonist must somehow defeat. In published accounts, Mario Merz has offered very few details of his life with Marisa, saying only, 
I met her in the late 50s, then we went to Switzerland. However, for decades now, a much more audacious version of their first meeting has circulated as a bit of gossip within the Italian art world. According to this version of events, the couple met because Marisa, recently jilted by her former lover, the famous Tournese painter Felice Casorati, attempted to commit suicide by throwing herself into the river in Turin, where she, whence she was rescued by Mario. So they say. The story is, at best, a Vazarian fable, and at worst, a malicious rumor. But utterly fabricated as it may be, embedded within the fiction of this origin story is a historical reality that something did cease to exist after 1960, and it is whoever Marisa was before she was missed. Marisa Metz has never revealed her maiden name, and nothing of her schooling, family background, childhood proclivities, Really, any of the relevant details typically supplied regarding an artist's early life has been published. Amidst the refusal of biography and the absence of actual historical data, folklore is all that remains. And this lore suggests an identity that was assumed, occupied rather than given, so much so that it has in fact produced confusion between Mario and Marisa Metz in multiple exhibitions and publications. In the context of historic exhibitions of Arte Povera in particular, it has often been unclear which Metz was intended by the name. Yet despite this confusion and elision of the two persons of Mario and Marisa Merz, their historiographies have nevertheless been marked by gender difference. The irony is that as much as their work was implicated, its interpretation was separated by inherent biases resulting from their respective roles as husband and wife. This appears in multiple instances, not least of which is the tendency to caricature the physical differences between them as a preamble to a discussion of their work. Thus Mario looms as a sort of mountain against which Marisa appears slight, a, dis a disparity which somehow then justifies the insinuation of her work into the bounded cloister of the domestic realm. Beyond treating the connection between Marisa's work and motherhood, cliches regarding timelessness, intimacy, and an innate connection to nature seem nigh unavoidable in discussion of Marisa Merz's work. Indeed, the perception of Marisa Merz as the hermit of Turin is relatively pervasive in the scholarship, such that isolation, retreat, and particularly Mar Merz's presumed distance from her male peers within Arte Povera is the rhetorical framework through which much of her work has been understood. The degree to which troops of exclusion or lack of acceptance were axiomatic within criticism of, of her work was already evident by 1976. Writing in Studio International, Anne-Marie Boletti, the Mertz's contemporary, who was the subject of a great talk by Teresa, dryly noted how male critics created a spectacle of apology. In Italy today, we frequently find, quote, in Italy today, we frequently find male art critics or amateurs who make a great show of accusing themselves of having excluded women from the mainstream of artistic activity. They exact the consecration of great women artists who had either been forgotten, for instance, Marisa Metz, or eclipsed after a brilliant first stage of their career, Carla Cotti. They exalt the entry or re-entry of these artists into the economy of artistic expression." End quote. There is a neat circularity in the idea of Marisa Metz's work re-performing its own self-imposed isolation within the space of the gallery. This emphasis on exclusion is to some degree valid, especially given the view that, quote, he was the artist, she was the wife, something that was said to me in my research, was obviously fairly common in the early decades of her career. Nevertheless, I think that such readings misconstrue Marisa Metz's relative position within the loose constellation of figures at one point or another grouped together under the heading Arte Povera. They also ignore the degree to which her work does much more than obsessively rehearse its own marginalization. In fact, I want to argue that it is precisely how connection and separation are held in tension within her work that renders it interesting. Furthermore, the balance struck between the defensive posture embodied within the work and its more overtly aggressive character was determined not just by critical stereotypes applied to her, but also by the readings imputed to Mario's work. If wife and mother are the reigning metaphors governing discussions of Marisa Merz, Mario Merz instead appears as the nomad warrior, poet, philosopher, architect. Explanations of his work are laced with stereotypes of masculine vigor and frequently devolved into a vulgar parody of notions of engorgement and penetration. 
This tendency becomes explicit in the introductory essay to Mario Metz's 1989 retrospective at the Guggenheim by German on Chelant. Take, for example, a passage in which Chelant discusses an untitled series Mario Metz began in 1964, a group of shaped wall-mounted relief sculptures like the one you see here. These three-dimensional works are an obvious outgrowth of the artist's painting practice, and in that respect, Chalant's point is well taken. However, Chalant characterizes them in extremely overblown language as actual physical ejaculations. I sometimes wonder if Chalant was being facetious, but then this example is just one of several references to sex and semen throughout the text. Amidst all this masculine vigor, I suppose it comes as no surprise that while the notion of habitat has been consistently applied to Mario Mestre's igloos, the, ideas of the, the idea of the domestic has not. Indeed, critics have gone to rather great lengths to skew any association with domesticity or nurture within his work, even, at, even as it deals with quotidian notions of nourishment and housing. In the mid-1960s, Mario Merz began experimenting with a series of objects made from everyday items. Some appear to be experimental works that were never shown or documented publicly, like this remarkable experimental image of a work using neon and a plastic bedpan at left. Others were more, more fully finished works though, which were exhibited shortly after their creation. However, Chalent does not refer to these materials as domestic objects, but instead as everyday devices. He calls Metz's bottles and chamber pots and raincoats aids for living, drawing on the famous Corbusian formulation of the house as a machine for living, thereby marshalling the August lineage and abstracted intellectual discourse surrounding architecture and design, not the humdrum of housekeeping errands and routine caregiving. Yet this reticence to acknowledge the domestic context from which these objects were generated is, sus is suspect. After all, not all of these works even made it outside the confines of the home slash studio space in the first place. Furthermore, the theme of the communal table is a recurring leitmotif in Mario's work. He created a series of drawings of tables and glasses in, 19, in the 1970s, as well as paintings and three-dimensional sculptural works drawing on the theme through the final decades of his career. Sometimes the table and its related accoutrement are treated as generic form. However, it is hard to see this 1978 drawing of an ornate neo-Gothic chair as a mere device. It is so incongruously foreshortened, so decorative in its outlines, so clearly reminiscent of their actual kitchen chair. The macho rhetoric of much of the criticism of Mario's work has meant that Marisa's contribution to it has been tardily, if ever, acknowledged. In fact, the 2016 exhibition curated by Claudio Crescentini, Costantino Dorazio, and Federica Pirani at Macro, mounted 13 years after Mario's death, was the first institutional survey of their work as a couple. If Mario was making aids for living, which nevertheless circumvented the imaginary of the domestic sphere, so too did Marisa Mertz's living sculpture utterly refute the stereotype of the reclusive housewife. Displayed in various iterations since the mid 1960s, the invasive behemoth calls into question how much of the relative differences in stature and ambition between Mario and Marisa have been characterized. Teresa Kittler has written in a detailed and convincing manner on the various iterations, iterations that this modular folded and stapled aluminum mobile has taken since it was first exhibited in 1967. Kittler's analysis is absolutely correct regarding the overdetermined nature of the readings applied to the work, which typically confine Metz's practice to the narrowly domestic, with the traditional gendering of that space remaining unchallenged and emptied of political significance. The sprawling tubular appendages of the living sculpture, which has been compared to a womb generating forms, sensations, visual emotions, are often bogged down by so many feminine metaphors. Against this understanding of the living sculpture as a pliable, receptive backdrop, Kittler articulates the way in which the work's own physicality and corporeality transcend these confines, showing how it threatened to obliterate the space, quote, threatened to obliterate the space in which it was created and pointed to an experience of claustrophobia and suffocation as much as it registers the time devoted to childcare. Kittler also notes the insistence of Mitz's longtime friend, gallerist Alessandro Bonomo, that the work was intended to function as an obstacle. I think something more needs to be said regarding the specificity of the obstacle that the living sculpture presented, particularly as the work may have been visible within the apartment in its incipient stages as early as 1965, two years before it was exhibited publicly 
and as so many of its documented iterations appear within the home. The brute physicality of the living sculpture certainly dressed something, or should I say someone, other than merely deflecting the constrictive interpretations that would be retrospectively applied to it. In actuality, it menaced the other occupants who shared its habitat, Mario and Beatrice, who herself recalls being afraid of the work as a child. The expansion and contraction of the living sculpture visualized a concern shared by Mario and Marisa Metz regarding the physical act of occupying space, a concern thematized in the experimental, highly politicized cli artistic climate of Turin at that moment through a continual reference to guerrilla warfare and student and labor rebellion. Its protean modularity demonstrated the inverse relationship between scale and concentration that would subsequently be paraphrased on Mario Metz's first igloo, which is decorated with the trenchant phrase barred from a famous Vietnamese general. If the enemy masses his forces, he loses ground. If he scatters, he loses strength. The living sculpture repeatedly staged and restaged these ideas within their shared home atelier. In collapsing into corners, it overtook the periphery. Massing together constituted a conspicuous display of strength. Nevertheless, when its component parts were torn into separate pieces and severed limb from limb, it covered the most ground. When it hung from the ceiling in small coils, it occupied a defensive position. Its various deployments embodied a parable of scale that applied not only to the movements of insurgents against Western hegemonic political powers, but also visualized the act of resistance as a corporeal structural principle. In other words, an embodied personal and political reality as force, mass, and dispersal. If the association between sculptural form and political reality was rendered visible in Marisa Metz's earliest known sculpture, then the same can be said for Mario's work at virtually the same moment. The Igloo de Jap was the first of many igloos subsequently executed by Mario Metz. It was created in late 1967 or 68 and displayed at the Deposito d'Arte Presente in Torino, a temporary art space in an abandoned garage that was the brainchild of a group of Arte Povera artists and supported by the gallerist John Enzo Susterone and the collector Marcello Levi. It was exhibited again in 1968 at the Arco d'Aliber, where an image by Claudio Abate shows Mario and Marisa Metz at work together, arranging the neon letters that bear the inscription. This is a rather obvious example of collaboration between the two artists, and indeed, Marisa Metz was frequently pictured working on or perambulating through Mario Metz's installation. In that sense, it is obvious that their collaboration was tangible and direct throughout his career. Marisa Metz was almost always present in the execution and realization of Mario's work from the late 1960s until his death. <clears throat> However, they collaborated in tangible but still significant manner through the mutual responses embedded within their otherwise discrete bodies of work. Mario Metz has spoken in detail about the genesis of the igloo within his work, saying, the igloo is the ideal organic shape. It is both a world and a small house. And also the igloo is an experienced scrap. The igloo gathers materials like a cup, its inverted shape clinging to traces of its environment, both land and architecture as it reappears in new habitats. The igloo was thus a result of the experience of living of occupying space and being in the world. More specifically though, the igloo was a reminder of the couple's own highly mobile lifestyle as the two quote, lived like gypsies within the otherwise conventional backdrop of a middle-class apartment building. It notionally transplanted the ethos of the various Turin apartments shared by Mario, Marisa and Beatrice into the exhibition space itself. Such is obvious from the world in miniature witnessed in Mario's 1969 Atico show, which reconstructs their riverfront Turinese ambit through a makeshift bridge, igloo, and even the presence of the family car. Uh, Mario Martz also tied the igloo to Jap specifically to an experience of agonism, uh, describing combat in dialectical terms rather than purely pugilistic ones. Linking it to, linking this phrase, if the enemy masses his forces, he loses ground, if he scatters, he loses strength, to Eastern philosophy, Mertz understands it as having both political and figurative connotations. There is a literal and metaphorical non-angularity to Mertz's interpretation. Just as the closed circular form of the igloo itself is contiguous, 
So the relative power shifts between two opposing parties, excuse me, so the relative power shifts between two opposing parties forms a sort of zero sum game. In other words, force is understood here not as a form of usurpation. Instead, force is the dispersal of mass or influence, something which is necessarily shared. It is a sort of dance between an individual and the object they are scrutinizing. When Mario refers to the person reading the words when talking about this, the igloo, uh, he is ostensibly talking about the person circumnavigating the igloo itself and thus implicating an audience of fellow artists in which Marisa Merz, as the first likely to encounter the work, was paramount. Thus, the igloo de Jap offers an early acknowledgement on Mario's part of the problem of occupying the same sphere as, as Marisa Merz a problem thematized in my earlier discussion of their public personas, and again in the aggressive response to cohabitation embodied in the living sculpture. For Mario though, the igloo also represented something of a fantasy of containment. As much as its construction entailed an acknowledgement of the other, its shape also suggested an isolated world unto itself. It also demonstrated a tendency towards camouflage. Various early iterations of the igloo were emblazoned with the phrase, objet cache toi, object hide yourself. And Merck's references secreting paintings and other objects inside that were thereby rendered inscrutable. In reference to the igloo de Jop, Merck has spoken of his interest in creating space, quote, independent of the process of hanging things on the wall and putting them on a table. Hence the idea of the igloo as the idea of absolute and self-contained space. It is not modeled, it is a hemisphere placed on the ground, end quote. If Mario understand the igloo on the one hand as habitable, as shared, as necessarily implicating the space of the other, he also understood it as invariable, uniform, and invisible to the outside world. The igloo presents a form of what Merz's American counterparts might have termed specificity, a means of undifferentiation that refuses distinctions between figure and ground, interior and exterior, all of those differences on which representation relies. As a basic form, there is only one igloo. This conceptual totality makes the progress of different, different igloos through different installations occasionally difficult to track, but it also underlines the degree to which the igloo signified a certain hermeticism or independence from the world as much as an investment in it. Similarly, in the work of Marisa Merck, the aggressive and invasive posture of the living sculpture is counterbalanced with expressions of defense and separation. In fact, barriers, membranes, and screens are central to Meritz's work throughout the next four decades of her career. Her work evinces a consistent fascination with prophylaxis, that is the need to protect or insulate the body. Meritz's use of blankets, items intended to insulate the body from cold, seem an obvious example of this tendency. Around 1968, Marisa began creating a series of works using rolled and bound up blankets, known by the Ital their Italian name coperte, they were displayed in various exhibition contexts, including in group and solo shows. And they were also used as part of a performance on the beach at Fregene outside Rome, where Mario was photographed dropping them in the sand to be lapped by the waves. Luciere has observed that the coperte carried on Mario's shoulder, both metonymically and synecdocally invoke the family bed. These seemingly enigmatic fabric coils also anticipate the spiral shape that would become a subsequent, a frequent subject in Mario's work. Effectively, the coperte implicate Mario's presence while also furnishing a precedent for his subsequent work. Thus, paradoxically, physical separation also entailed familiarity and investment. For better or for worse, Marisa and Mario's bodies of works were nested together. The nautilus shell, which features in Mario's oeuvre, was not merely a physical instantiation of the Fibonacci sequence, but a metaphor of coupling a nested line that spins out from the center, indelibly inter separating indelibly interconnected regions of space, making inside and outside difficult, if not impossible to distinguish. The direction of the spiral is consistent yet constantly shifting, just as Mario and Marisa managed to diverge while working in parallel. Mario managed to tie his adoption of the Fibonacci sequence to biological incidents and procreation noting, quote, we have five fingers, two eyes, and one nose, quote, and that the sequence also describes the order of seeds in a pine cone. He acknowledged the Fibonacci sequence as a metaphor for natural reproduction, 
wherein the preceding two digits function as parents, which generate the subsequent number, leading to a proliferation of individual units rather than the creation of a single mass. By extension, the Fibonacci sequence became a metaphor of ideal sociality. This concept was in turn embodied throughout his oeuvre in the table. In various works, both in two dimensions and in three, Mario employed the table to signify ritual and man's need for company. He explained, quote, the table is deeply rooted in ancient culture and has become a sort of habitual life companion. The table is an object which stimulates affection in that, perhaps to a lesser degree than the bed, it is an object through which the house is seen in very human terms, end quote. Thus, there is a degree to which the table implicated his own family life, as well as to the family as an institution subject to generational change. In adopting the table as a motif, Mario was drawing on prior work by Marisa, whose appropriated found tables were part of her installation, as I previously showed, at the Galleria Lassico in 1970. The table soon became a site for mutual exchange and play, visualizing the constant reversals and inversions of their imbricated practice. The simplified round forms ornamenting Mario's early, draw early drawings, like the 1971 Spirale Contaste, Spiral with Cups, provoked a slew of Mario's sub subtly differentiated small clay round heads. As if embodying the drawing, these heads would subsequently be installed as permanent guests on glass and iron spiral tables designed for Mario's installation. A similar operation is visible in the relationship between Mario's drawings of triangular shapes intended to visualize tables radiating in a spiral outward from the center of the paper or wall and the pennant shaped copper mesh constructions with which Marissa repeatedly experimented in the 1980s and 90s. As Mario Marissa's work evolved, the Fibonacci sequence increasingly subsumed the igloo as the grand representative of the prevailing structure of the universe. As a mental vector, the Fibonacci sequence and the spiral were perhaps better suited than the hemisphere to express both the harmony of being and the infinite expansion of time and matter. Mario's work from the 1970s onwards became increasingly addressed to a totalizing notion of creation. This demiurgic impulse was expressed through both written language and formal means. The force of Mario's timeless transcendent originary symbolism was such that he was hailed as, quote, understanding the totality of phenomena, and unquote, more than any single person. The audacity of such claims was matched by the seeming inevitability of the processes Mario's work described or visualized. Fibonacci is, after all, a sort of visualization of natural law, of a cycle of birth and death in which the individual is mere preamble. Of course, the evitability or inevitability of sex and procreation was precisely at issue in the 1970s in Italy, as successive waves of legislative activism renegotiated established norms surrounding contraception, abortion, and divorce. If Mario visualized the necessity of procreation and proliferation in his works, let's go back to this actually. If Mario visualized the necessity of procreation and proliferation in his works and words of the 1970s, Mario's immense use of copper mesh can be understood as prophylactic. It forms a protective layer, a patch, even a sort of chain mail when worn on the body. Particularly fascinating is the, is the resonance between some of Marie Zemes' more enigmatic sculptural elements created from coiled copper wire. This example, only about an inch in diameter, and a contemporary development in reproductive health technology, the copper IUD or intrauterine device, a form of birth control which became available in Italy in the late 1960s, in which was known parochi parochially, and still is in Italian as the spiral. A close reading of the sculptural installations in which Merz deployed her seemingly esoteric copper fixtures demonstrates how Merz harnessed the implicit and explicit associations of the material of copper to reference a new, often invisible form of domestic alchemy. In the 1977, uh, in 1977, at the Galleria Salvatore Alla in Milan, Marisa Merz created the most ambitious and painstaking installation she had yet attempted. In the main room, an unhinged door, previously leading to the cellar, was set on the ground. From it, spools of copper wire ascended to create a complicated and intersecting web of filaments 
that traversed the walls and bisected the room at odd angles, occasionally moored to assemblages of stone, wood, fruit, flowers, and furniture scattered at various points along the floor. Floating within this network were woven elements recognizable only from previous installations. Woven copper squares, the scarpette or little shoes, but also more enigmatic miniature constructions of copper or nylon filament. Sometimes these forms resembled disc, discs, cups, and coils. Sometimes they took on triangular shapes or irregular biomorphic contours that curled around needles or wire matrices. In a side room, a mesh wall construction was mounted above a table covered with copper wire mesh squares. Scattered around, scattered around the gallery were a precious few recognizable domestic objects, primarily a red bolster pillow from Bea's bedroom placed on the floor between two windows and at least one wrapped blanket suspended within the framework. A walking stick leaned haphazardly against one wall. And I'll go back to this image. In the disused basement, a similarly hermetic air reigned as cups of salt and salt water were tucked into recesses in the brick walls, which along with the barrel vaulted ceiling appeared to dematerialize thanks to a scintillating semi-transparent screen of woven copper, copper squares applied to it. Within the Galleria Alla installation, Marisa Metz's self-referentiality to her own status as a woman is both pointed and opaque. The year prior, a 1975 article by the Italian, uh, 1976 article by the Italian critic Tommaso Trini offered perhaps the most important discussion of Marisa's work vis-a-vis -vis her status as a woman artist, which he defines as somewhat tangential or at least divorced from the aesthetic language of the work and the recipro reciprocal productive relationship she had with Mario. Trini distinguishes between exchange value and use value, that is, not just price, but the degree to which the work is useful and generative for other artists. He also acknowledges the pervasive hostility amongst Italian artists in the 1960s towards the critic or historian, who is presumed to control the, control the use value of works more than their exchange value. With a somewhat pejorative aside directed at Carlo Lonzi and the radical separatist flank of Italian feminism, Trini tries to distance Marisa's work from the notion of women's or feminist art. He states, quote, I have no excuse to discuss Marisa Mertz's art, Marisa Mertz's art without adopting fem a feminist point of view, but that isn't my viewpoint. I fear I do worse. Even if I only discussed Marisa's work, Mario's work would perforce be mixed up in it, end quote. In contrast to those contemporary critics like Anne-Marie Boetti, who saw Mart Mertz's work as an important early example of feminist practice, for Trini, it is precisely this relationship to Mario that made any discussion of feminism with respect to the work inapplicable. In his reading, Trini equates feminism to a masquerade of false masculinity, invoking the figure of the hermaphrodite as a metaphor for women whose feminist stance merely serves in his mind to mimic or arrogate male privilege. But his vindication of Mario's relationship with, with Marisa's relationship with Mario at the expense of any association with feminism or the sexual politics of the body suggests a false binary as if one precluded the other. Marisa's 1977 ALA installation was absolutely predicated on establishing a relationship between copper, connectivity, desire, and power. Rife with veiled sexual symbolism, it parodies Trini's evaluative tropes and the binaries he imposed. As if in response to Trini's invocation of the figure of Penelope, the article is titled The Anti-Penelope, who daily weaves and nightly unweaves her tapestry to keep the encroaching suitors at bay in the Greek myth, the web of copper traversing and occluding the main space functions as both a net and obstacle. The woven patches and discs themselves form an evocative pattern of lines, shadows, and blanks whose visual impact is amplified by the presence of spotlights. The main gallery space becomes the antechamber in which the suitors are held at bay, and the intimate subterranean cavern, the bedroom itself. That the door to the basement serves as the loom framework from which the tapestry initially springs reinforces this metaphor of separation between public and private space. Just as the tables, fruits, and flowers represent the accoutrement of entertaining visitors. 
The walking stick propped against the wall even provides something of a tongue-in-cheek reference to the disguised Ulysses dons to cover his true identity. After all, if Marisa is in this metaphor the anti-Penelope, then Mario was her Ulysses. His presence is therefore implicit, but not actual. Without dramatizing the narrative itself, the installation nevertheless unfolds sequentially within the space, as does the process of revelation and reunion dramatized within the Homeric epic. Though Mertz's tapestry was ostensibly abstract, it can never entirely refuse signification. The tapestry could, however, signify refusal. This refusal was accomplished in two ways. First, the polysemy of copper itself as a material that, both, that produced both connection and insulation. And secondly, the evasive enigmatic nature of the shapes it took. Suggesting that Marisa Mertz's work invokes a, myth, a mythic past, Karina Ferrari's subsequent review of the installation spoke of the pervasiveness of copper in Marisa Mertz's work. Against the princely hypnotic spl splendor of gold, copper instead is a utilitarian domestic metal. It doesn't stand for, in her, to quote, it doesn't stand for anything, it is everywhere. It is electric, it conducts energy. It is a metal of circulation, it is a thread vehicle, pure circuit, end quote. For Ferrari, the fascination of Mertz's materials lie in their exploration of alchemy. The quote, internal transformations of substances, the transmutation from one state to another of matter, the marriages of material, the reciprocal bond, bonds, end quote. Alluding to Mario's presence through both linguistic and material reference, Ferrari situates the Allah installation as an alchemical reaction that was at once hermetic and unifying. She interprets the installation as an act or ceremony of mediation between, on the one hand, the availability of copper as a pervasive utilitarian metal, and on the other, the ecstatic beauty of uncontainable, indescribable forms. Boetti, writing in Studio International on an important presentation of Italian women artists, also evokes the notion of alchemy in describing Marisa Mertz's work. Quote, she creates new alchemical reactions between elementary substances between candle and lead for their different degree of softness and the consequent abuse of the one over the other, between the eternity of gold and the precariousness of salt esoterically united in the salt ring, unquote. Thus the different physical qualities of various elements suggest symbolic, symbolic power imbalances that are rectified only in their conjunction. For both authors, the installation ultimately functions as a, as a symbolic marriage ritual between universal elements. Yet another, and I would argue extremely important signification of copper is hidden within this discourse of desire of consummate, of quote, consummation continually maintained, end quote. This is because copper was not just being obscured within the walls of domestic and industrial spaces, but within the female body as well. Over the course of the 1970s, in Italy, as well as other parts of the world, copper was increasingly promoted for its contraceptive properties. The prophylactic effects of copper, whose filaments constituted the active element in different types of intrauterine devices, variously fabricated with nylon, silk, and other synthetic fibers, were first publicized in 1968. Though their legal status was somewhat undetermined, Copper-based intrauterine devices were widely available in Italian pharmacies after 1973. Exactly how copper functioned as a contraceptive was something of a mystery, even to the scientists involved. Nevertheless, it was well established that the presence of fairly minuscule amounts of copper within the body effectively suppressed pregnancy and resulted in physical changes to the chemical composition of the uterine membrane. Modern alchemy indeed. What Ferrari refers to as, quote, spontaneous little shapes, end quote, suspended within that web of copper were not entirely happenstance. The petite arc of woven copper, copper wire floating above the supine door is deeply suggestive of the shape, placement, and composition of the most popular of several available intrauterine devices. Indeed, Merce's enigmatic assemblages of patches, sponges, and discs, themselves sometimes no more than a few centimeters in diameter, mimic the formal vocabulary of a range of historical and contemporary contraceptive methods. 
that the knitting needles onto which these coils and barriers were often mounted were not just neutral domestic instruments, but remained throughout the 1970s highly charged symbols of the dangers of back alley abortions must be noted as well. It may seem somewhat outrageous to compare Marie Zemetz's work to developments in reproductive technology. And I am cautious about the pitfall of essentialism. The tendency to see Marisa Mertz's work as a synecdoche for the artist herself, and in particular her reproductive organs, is widespread. Such reductionism tends to mystify and impede a more ample understanding of the context in which the work was produced. Nevertheless, bodily associations are intentionally present in her work, as is evident in the grotesque jumble of metal entrails that was the living sculpture, or in the little shoes sized to her own feet. Celso Boetti acknowledged that the climate of Arte Povera facilitated this. Yet in making connection between Mar Marisa's use of copper and its newfound application to birth control, I'm not attempting to chain the work to the artist's own biology. Indeed, the body is invoked precisely to distance such biologically determined destinies. Marisa Metz's work has been characterized as Venezu Venusiano, excuse me, that is evincing a certain sensual connection between body and earth, and while that is not untrue, it is in fact more apt description of Mario's piles of bright fruit and continued invocation of the Fibonacci sequence than to Marisa's foreboding installation and minuscule masses of copper and nylon. The contraceptive turn of Marisa, Marisa Merz's copper works offered a demonstration of refusal and self-preservation amidst Mario's continued and much publicized fascination with imbrication and pro penetration, proliferation and reproduction. Mario would note that neon crossing through a canvas or an image is always referring to that scientific situation of which we are fundamentally carriers. We know that all bodies are traversed by other bodies. His written statements are full of repeated references to the processes of bridging polar opposites or different states of matter. Mario invested this process of transversal with a mathematic or scientific inevitability. Quote, science tells us that in nature, the elements all pass into one another. The meaning of nature is transformation, end quote. Despite Mario's stated interest in equilibrium, the spectacle of neon light ripping, burning, and piercing canvases and other objects could appear quite violent. The all installation responds to the sexuality latent in Mario's seemingly non-referential work through counter-signification. Marisa finds her own means of emphasizing the artist's mobile body, which leaves enigmatic clues in space. Yet these clues hinge on a recipro reciprocal awareness of the body of the other. Marisa has never labeled her work feminist, yet she engages in a form of selective separatism that was both conditioned by and disinterested in contemporary debates. To understand how Merz, Marisa Merz negotiated these distinctions, it's important to point out that her resistance to the typical categories of art history was not a form of self-censorship. In fact, her silence was an articulate one. This antagonism played out in Allah in 1977, a grandly orchestrated display of abstract clarity and physical obfuscation. Rather than merely courting or making a spectacle of entanglement, the 1977 Allah installation functions to trap objects in stasis while choreographing the movements of viewers' bodies in such a way as to limit their access to particular zones. Physicality itself becomes dematerialized through the play of light as the copper appears to scintillate and make surfaces dissolve and through elemental natural processes like the evaporation of salt water. Yet calcification demonstrates the recalcitrance of these materials. The copper wires running throughout the Allah space evoke the arteries of the body, but they also suggest an electric fence trapping potential interlopers. This palimpsest of public and private registers enacted at the Allah installation confuses distinctions regarding what, what constituted feminist practice, which was being defined as the vindication over, of manual over conceptual work and the quote, return of the world of little things and an upsurge of interest in the universe of private life and autobiography, end quote. But Marisa's agglomeration of seemingly unassuming objects had epic political resonances. It not only parodies Mario's public persona, but hers as well. Through metaphor and material, we see a subjectivity attempting to define its own limits while also processing the limits imposed on it. Even when ostensibly separate, the work of Mario Marisa Merz formed a sustained conversation about the massing of scale, the occupation of space, 
and most importantly, the accessibility of the body, both real and imagined. As a result, their works unfolded within one another's presence, just as they rearticulated their own boundaries, creating a continual back and forth of mutual interpolation and self-defense. Their work offers a model of collaboration that was as much a response to conflict as it was a form of exchange, offering new avenues for collaborative practice that generate productive dissonance rather than ideal fiction. Thank you very much. Leslie, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk, really, really wonderful and uh, such an uh, original reading of uh, Mertz's work. We have um, time for a few questions. Um, as, um, Audience, as audience members uh, think about the questions they might want to ask you, I might start um, by asking you to say perhaps a little bit more about that fascinating material you shared with us towards um, the end of your talk in relation to Marisa Metz's um, installation at uh, ALA um, and your um, particularly original reading of her work. And, um, you did mention something about the context in which the work was made in terms of these uh, developments in um, reproductive uh, technology. And, um, but I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this. Would these associations have been widely recognized in, in um, response to Marisa Mertz's work? Um, you talked about how it was received and some of the sort of uh, uh, questions of gender and sexuality that came out of it, but in just in terms of the, the, the kinds of formal associations that you're, you're proposing. Um, and um, whether you might say time, you know, a little bit more about how that fits into her practice more broadly, it's, a, it's a, um, it, uh, this in relation to the question of sexuality and gender. How do we account for these explicit uh, political connections um, to development in, within um, the history of sexuality and reproduction, given her deliberate silence on, on those topics. Um, yeah. yeah, so well, I think it's important to note, especially for view, uh, listeners who are maybe not familiar with an Italian context, that the cultural evolution that we kind of um, are familiar with from, from a Anglophone context was played out very differently in Italy, and I, I for those of you who have that haven't seen the movie Divorce Italian Style, it's a good it's a good <laughs> primer to start with. But you know, in Italy, um, divorce wasn't legal until 1970, and abortion itself wasn't decriminalized until 1976. So um, the the kind of timeline of kind of feminist liberationist politics was. Um, uh, a little bit delayed, and 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 as a result, in some in some ways, the kind of um, really radical wings of Italian feminism were more perhaps visible than the sort of um, you know corresponding kind of style of feminism in the United States. So when when people thought when people think of feminism in Italy they really tend to think of uh, uh, an ex, you know, the most radical version of it. And, and they still, you know, to this day, when you talk to women, will say things like, well, I'm not a feminist, I like men. Um, so there's a kind of elision of, of things that we don't as much, you know, at least in kind of liberal or, or moderate circles in the United States allied here. Um, so, so her, I think, and a lot of artists in this moment, they're, unwillingness to define themselves as feminist, I think has to do with how feminism was being defined at that moment. And there are very rare exceptions. And even Carla Cardi, who was absolutely, you know, a founding mother of Italian feminism within the space of 10 years would basically deny having any, had anything to do with it. Um, so, it so it really, you know, as much as Italian feminism was kind of hatched in a lot of ways in the Italian art world, the Italian art world disavowed it at, by in turn. So it's so it's difficult to sort of you know make direct uh, links between Italian feminism and, and the arts because of that. 
But at the same time, I think in Maria Zemetz's work, you, you know, there was in 1966, she published this very interesting kind of statement of, of disavowal and, and basically saying, you know, that she makes the statement that I am, una I am unavailable to Mario and I'm unavailable to other men. Um, and and it's, an, it's kind of, it's an interesting phrase and very prescient in terms of the way that subsequently Italian separatist feminism would articulate itself as separation, as removal, as unavailability, as being only available to women and not to men. So even if she wasn't um, acknowledging that connection, that connection is certainly there. Um, and then I think in terms of, um, you know, so, and, and I think, you know, in terms of how, you know, what was, was the significance of the work intentional in such a way that she expected other viewers to see it? That I think is a really tough question because she had always, and, you know, refused to comment on virtually everything, <laughs> you know, including the city in which she was born, let alone the sort of interpretation of her work. So we, so we can never really know, but I, you know, to me, I think, the fact, you know, the fact that the, I, what we would call, um, you know, an IUD was known as the spiral. You know, I think that that, I think implicit in the discussions of alchemy and in the discussions of, you know, mystical marriages is this social context. And so I think it's gone, I think at the time, a woman in Italy seeing that work would have made that association, but probably not said it out loud. You know what I mean? So I think my, goal in the sort of approaching the scholarship is to sort of think, bring out um, these associations that certainly would have been there for, for a contemporary audience, but that um, our cultural context would probably make us more blind to. Yeah, thank you. That was really wonderfully answered. Um, just um, your, your point about the sort of alchemical um, connects to a question from uh, one of the audience members who asks, um, how both Mario and Marisa incorporated alchemical elements into their work, perhaps more broadly, um, and whether you can speak to that connection or point of collaboration. We, uh, we know or, um, the, the associations with alchemy um, in relation to Arte Povera are well known. Um, if we think of certain artists like um, uh, Zorio or uh, Calzolari, and I was just wondering if yeah. you could think about, yeah, I mean, just it, uh, connecting to the question that's been asked, but think about how um, how their relationship to this this uh, thematic or to this this question of alchemy um, either differs or or how they you know how they relate to it. Yeah, well, so that so it's interesting because it, yeah, certainly the, the the sort of fascination with alchemy was a was a lead motif throughout the Arte Povera circle. Um, though it is interesting that it shows up so strongly in the work of Gilberto Dorio, who was at one point Mario Mariza's son-in-law. Um, you know, so the 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 importance of it at, for them as a as a as a tribe is is um, kind of interesting. Um, but you know, I think I think the for, for Marisa, alchemy was generally metaphor. You know, in the Ala installation, there's, there's like little vats of salt. Um, often she would sort of set up altars as part of her other installations. And so this notion of um, the metaphor of the sacrament um, of, and transubstantiation, I think is like kind of background to a lot of the work this, and this kind of religious element. And there's examples in, in her work um, where, she's, where she's making you know, they're not immediately apparent as such, but they're her version of a Raphael Madonna, you know, so she's, she's making examples of religious imagery um, and recasting that. And so that was certainly very important to her, I think. Um, but I think very often it's, it's on the level of metaphor, I would say for Mario, it's, um, you know, when he's using like neon light and putting it on top of a vat of you know, a kitchen casserole pan filled with wax, he's, a, he's being a little bit more direct in his interest in alchemy. I think this, the whole, the sort of invention of neon as this kind of industrial material that was a gas that turned to light um, was in some sense, a kind of example of this kind of contemporary alchemy that they were both interested in. Um, 
so I, yeah, I mean, they, you know, they differed, but, you know, Marisa also, again, used, used wax, but her use of wax was generally as a veil or as, as an obstruction. So it, it falls more in line with this interest in prophylaxis and with, um, uh, with obscuring a surface rather than the actual transformation of matter into one, into a different state. Thank you. Um, there's a, another question from the audience member, and it, it um, well, I think it connects in part to the, 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 this very unusual imagery or the religious imagery that you've written about in relation to Marisa Mertz's um, practice. But um, the question asks, can you elaborate on the relationship and or lack thereof between Marisa and the other Arthepavara artists? I remember, you know, Catherine Grenier talked about the, uh, or, or quotes Piero Giladia saying that there was, you know, that there was a sort of misunderstanding in relation to Marie de Mertz's work. Um, but I wonder if you, yeah, if you've thought about her, her, um, her work in relation to other artists, not just Marie's, Mary Mertz's. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly not as much. Um, I was, you know, the, the, the catalog of the Gilberto Dorio show that, um, at the uh, in in Turin a couple of years ago is really interesting to look at because you can see so much relationship between um, between that work and and Mario Marisa's work work, but I think you know it, really there's you know the kind of the sort of incense rooms. I mean there's there's it's it's there's so much overlap, I would say, in terms of um, in terms of the work that she was doing and the sort of subsequent um, later work that a lot of Arte Povera artists are doing um, in terms of this interest in the kind of se sensuality and, and um, um, you know, going beyond the visual and sort of creating these immersive uh, environments that, you know, I think she was very much um, you know, I think the work was appreciated within artistic circles, even if it wasn't necessarily being publicized um, without those circles or outside of those circles. And also, you know, people have written about, um, you know, Carolyn Kristoff Bakarviev does write about how their, the Turin apartment that Mario and Marisa shared was in many ways a kind of local hub for the Turinese segment of that of the Arte Povera movement. And it, you know, it's difficult because, you know, this Mario Mertz, I think, was a um a very difficult personality and and one who was maybe not always welcoming um or approachable for younger artists. There are, there are, there's a lot of um you know off-color stories in terms of you know him destroying another artist's work because he didn't like it, that kind of thing that you hear that you know may or may not be true. It's, it's, again, it's all art world gossip, but, um, you know, and so, so, you know, you hear, all, you hear stories about like his, his being a little bit more um, unapproachable, but that's not really the reputation that she had. I mean, she was sort of unapproachable in that she was not talkative or communicative about her work um, personally, but the work was available and she was you know, there's, they were very much imbricated in that world. There's pictures of them at other people's openings and not even just restricted to the um, Arte Povera circle, but even the Trans Avantguardia, they, you know, they had very close, Mario and Marisa both had close ties to um, those artists as well. So I think again, yeah, this, this emphasis on her being a hermit, I think is, is misplaced in, in many, many ways. Um. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I just, um, as you were talking, it, it, and just thinking um, about your talk in relation to previous discussions or previous weeks, um, what what's been so striking um, is, um, or are some of the tensions and um, around the role and function of the biographical in relation to uh, this thematic and the attempt to kind of reinscribe some of these figures within a movement that ha, you know um, it, is, um, has been uh, conventionally understood as being so kind of male dominated. Um, and where in previous weeks, the biographical 
um, has given us a kind of important insight into working relations um, and gives us a glimpse into perhaps a sort of slightly different narratives. Um, here or in your talk, there's, there's a, such a deliberate refusal on the part of the artist or disruption of, um, of the kind of art historical convention of relying on the biographical um, to talk about um, work. This is more of a comment than, than anything else, but, um, and of course you reference that refusal, but I was wondering if you thought about it um, kind of methodologically or um, how that refusal on the part of the artist um, uh, allow, or, um, allowed you to kind of think about the questions, the kind of broad questions that were posed by the lecture series differently. Yeah, well, because I mean, it is interesting because I think um, you know, there is there is so much art history that is what you know we what we refer to as the the art history of the proper name, you know, and that I think we're all methodologically aware of those pitfalls. And there is a degree to which you know her Maria Zametz's refusal of that was um, an attempt to force the work to be recognized on its own merits um, and to not have it be overdetermined by her identity, whatever that may be. Um, but I also think functionally, it sort of did the opposite, you know, I mean, that, because, that, because that identity was not ever, you know, was, was in, inevitable. And so much of the writing about her was about her in relationship to him which is not something that you see in the writing on him. You know, he is able to function as an artist independently, whereas there's really very few commentators in that moment that can talk about her as an artist without reference to him. Um, and so part of me really wonders if, you know, if we, if we had a sense of who she was before she became Marisa Merz, would we have a sort of, you know, would it give us a different dimension or lend a different understanding to her practice? Um, yeah, I, and but that I think is research that's still sort of ongoing. And I, you know, I, you know, and, and how much that will become available is I think still very much an open question. I mean, um, I think the the Fondazione Merz is still very much interested in preserving uh, the viewpoint that she espoused, which is that none of that matters. Um, and so, you know, whether there will be more published attention to, to that earlier part of her life, which I find very interesting, um, is, is a question. Yeah, and it certainly is, you know, in, in relationship to the series, it is also interesting because she really was, you know, for a long time, she was the only female artist that was publicly acknowledged as part of Arte Povera. And, you know, uh, Anne Marie Sozo Boetti was really seen as more of a critic. And the, you know, it's, so she was, she was in a singular position um, that is only now starting, I think, to be rounded out. And so what that does to the scholarship on her, I think is another interesting question. Yeah, um, and uh, just one final point. Um, you touched on this reading, a uh, really interesting reading of Mario Mertz's work in relation to the domestic, so rather than in um, well, rejecting some of the kind of uh, terminology that's been imposed on it in, in or, or attempted to displace that aspect of his work. And um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that, whether that's something that's becoming more, um, uh, uh, that's been written about more in relation to Mario Mertz's work, or, um, and if it's, if in if it's uh, been a response in part to the way in which Marisa Mertz's work has, um, has uh, been uh, conceived or imagined. Yeah, I mean, you know, to my knowledge, no, though, there was a very, a very interesting book recently had just come out about, um, you know, the, the domestic and Italian feminism or in Italian art. And it's a really, it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting survey that does a lot of, that covers a lot of ground, but, you know, again, it's really Marisa that's featured in the book and not Mario. 
So I, you know, I think that this is, I think that this conception of them as working in two different spheres is still pretty much um, the operative paradigm. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think slowly people are, because of the work done on her, it's people are starting to realize that, um, there, that, that she was inevitably part of his work. But even, you know, even, even when that is acknowledged, it's acknowledged in this way where the consequences of that are really left unexamined. And one of the obituaries for, for Mario Menes when he dies, um, you know, Mario, uh, Germano Chalant says something along the lines of she was, per, you know, her work was perforce bound up in it. But there's not, you know, the discussion of, or, or no, I guess that's, that was Trini, but there's some acknowledgement that she was the one who was like setting his tables. But it's still this kind of very gendered binary of, you know, he was, you know, he was the carpenter and she was the cook <laughs> in this very Italian way. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done to sort of yeah. in that. Here, and I think that's a really good moment to end. <laughs> a lot of work to be done. All that remains to be said is a huge thank you to you, Leslie, um, for your really fascinating talk. I, I, um, it was really thrilling and uh, for taking the time to answer these questions, um, but also to uh, Lucia Re and Sharon Hecker for participating in this series. Uh, Leslie's talk will be available on Magazino's website um, in due course where you can also access um, the other talk so thank you um, thank, thank you so much and um, and goodbye to the um, to those of you that tuned in thank you so much Teresa thank you for the whole staff bye ciao